I screwed up on this figure yesterday. This is getting into cancer now. And there are also seasonal effects in cancer where rates of cancer and um, risks and in incidents of survival change with the year. So what you've got is a graph, and I'm going to change this figure to make it a little easier. Okay? So what you've got are two figures at the top, a figure for women who develop uh, bowel cancer, colorectal cancer. Okay? And as you go upward in a graph, it means the probability of something happening. So what it's done, from left to right, you've got a calendar of months, January, February, March, etc. I've shown you where summer is. So these green lines indicate the probability, on average, of getting bowel cancer and getting diagnosed with bowel cancer at various months of the year. But the interesting thing is, if you're diagnosed during the summertime, you're less likely of a bad thing happening. And that rep red line represents the four-year survival. In other words, if your cancer is diagnosed in January, they call it low comparative risk of one, of dying after within four years. If your same cancer were diagnosed during the summertime, your survival is 80% better. And it's 20% it's less mortality and uh, less risk of death during the summer. The same group, they've done further studies and they looked at other things like breast cancer. If it's diagnosed um, in the late summer or fall compared to the winter time, your, age, your uh, adjusted relative risk of uh, dying is less. Your risk of dying of colon cancer is less in women and men. Um, prostate cancer, the risk of dying of prostate cancer is less if you were diagnosed and treated during the summer than if it happened during the winter. Pieces of a puzzle. These are not perfect kinds of research. This is um, a presentation out of the American Aca uh, Association of Cancer Research meeting from May 2000. And this is um, a similar kind of research that was looking at um, men or women with stage one or stage two, relatively mild lung cancer. And what they're doing is looking at the number of people living still after five years. And this is just the, the highlight of it. If a man or a woman is diagnosed with having lung cancer of a low grade during the winter and they don't take vitamin D, their odds of surviving five years are about 45%. On the other hand, if they were diagnosed during the summer, and they were in the highest bunch of people with vitamin D, in other words, they probably drank a fair bit of milk and regularly took vitamins, their odds of surviving were more than 80% odds of five-year survival. Again, pieces of a puzzle. This is some research that we did um, in Toronto, and what you've got here is following uh, something called prostate-specific antigen. As men get older, their prostate enlarges, and there's a blood test that you can do to monitor the growth of prostate tissue. And these were men who started off around 1995 with uh, relatively high PSAs, more than four. So then they get followed, and every three months or so, they measure the PSA level. And we have 200 men, that, uh, it was 193 men that we were following. There was no prostate cancer, but it's just followed. But the graph here at the top shows the way average blood vitamin D levels fluctuate. They go up and down through the quarters of the year. So what I've pulled, done is pulled together every calendar quarter for a PSA measurement, and I'm following the rate at which PSA increases. So starting in January, PSA goes up about almost 4%. But what I'm showing there, that hook in the middle, is a summertime holiday where if you take a whole bunch of men and follow their PSAs, the PSA stops going up for a little while during the summer, and then come fall, it's going up again. Not proof. But what another thing that we did with, with a similar kind of group of men is, is the following. What you've got here are men who um, had their prostate taken out or who had radiation that was supposed to cure their prostate cancer. And usually it works. But in one third of men, something happens. The PSA starts going up again. Now, what do you do? Well, you know, either you can give them what's effectively called a hormonal castration, hormone therapy, but that's almost like a last resort. And there's no proof that that affects survival much. 
what they traditionally do is just sit and wait. They keep following the PSA levels. One doesn't know how to deal with it because the prostate's gone. So what we did here was follow PSAs and the, the um, um, radiation oncologist that was treating the patients asked the patients, go on to vitamin D, 2,000 units per day. Okay, now we followed two periods of time before starting the vitamin D, largely because I wanted to see what happens if you don't do anything. Doing nothing, the PSA in this kind of man went up by about 5% per month and it stayed that way. Monthly, 5% higher. There's a little bit of statistical noise, but it rose. You can see the box plots. We've got 15 men in this study and half of them are in the middle of the box there, right? But after they started taking the vitamin D, and this is following for a year or more, the rate of rise of PSA went from 5% down to 2% per month. You'd be happy with that. If you have something bad happening, you'd rather have it go slower than faster. Now, totaling, eh, as it's progressing over the course of the year, PSA kind of goes up and it goes up. Then the doctor says, don't, you know, start taking your 2,000 units of vitamin D now. And the PSA may have still gone up, but it's going up slower. This was an unfunded study and we're still trying to get research money to follow this more thoroughly. If it were as a drug, you bet we'd have money. And here's just a moment of editorial frustration. Why can't you get any more vitamin D in the pills or in the food supplements that you get? And the problem is official government funded committees have to meet in order to look at the science that I'm trying to present to you here and make new recommendations so that the drug company or the pharmaceutical companies can put more vitamin D into their pills. They're not allowed to put more in it than what is in there. You may know the truth. I think I know the truth and scientists know the truth that human beings need more than 400 international units. And if you speak to anybody that's ever studied nutrition at university and ask them, tell me about what you learned about nutrition and vitamin D. The thing that they say, you know, you have to be very careful with vitamin supplements because, you know, taking too much of vitamins can be toxic. And in particular, we learn that taking too much vitamin D is toxic. So be very careful of vitamin D. It's that, it's that example of bad things happening. At least that's what they learned in school. So this is just going on a little bit longer now with regard to um, potential effects of low vitamin D levels in your blood. This is something that's pretty well known. Most of these are statistics that are publicly available through the National Cancer Institute in the US. And these are graphs that were put together by a NASA scientist. He had satellite data that recorded or showed how much ultraviolet light B, the vitamin D producing ultraviolet light was shining on different cities in the United States. And he took cancer statistics. All right. So every dot there that you see on the graph is a different municipality in the United States. And it's graphed against how much ultraviolet light it tends to get versus the number of people who die of different cancers every year. So if you go down to the southern latitudes like Florida, on average, every year for 100,000 women who live in the city, 20 die of breast cancer every year. If you head northward toward places like Minnesota, 30 women per 100,000 die of breast cancer every year. Taking another step over, here's another cancer. You can easily get the data. Bladder cancer. In the south, four per 100,000 die of bladder cancer every year. In the north, it's eight. Another one, ovarian cancer for 100,000 women in the south, seven die of ovarian cancer. In the north, 10. Uh, rectal cancer or large bowel cancers, you can see the numbers. Um, colon cancer, okay, you go from 15 in the south to 25 in the north. And here's the key thing, 
This is talking ultraviolet light intensity to a city. It's the stuff that causes skin cancer. So you go, for all these cancers, you know, there's that cost. More ultraviolet light causes skin cancer. Look at the skin cancer death statistics and compare them. The price of going from Florida, uh, going south down to Florida, is maybe one or two extra skin cancer deaths. But start adding up those other cancers that I was showing to you. Do the math. If you had to worry about two extra chances of skin cancer at the price of saving yourself 30 or more extra deaths due to breast or colon, etc., do the math. And then, of course, there's the easy out. Take more vitamin D. Unfortunately, you're not able to buy in the store enough vitamin D to make this kind of difference. The only way you can get these kind of vitamin D levels to make a difference, officially, is to go in the sun. But, of course, they tell you don't. Now, here's another interesting part to the story. Official dietary guidelines were designed by a white population to protect white babies from having rickets. Okay, the disease that related to changes in skin color years ago. Now, what's happening in modern times? We have a lot of immigration. People designed by natural selection and their heritage to live near the equator, designed largely to have black skin because it's the best thing for where they live, are moving to places in the north. The problem is, might thought that not have some health consequences? These are data that you can easily look on the internet. There's a lot of publicly available numbers you can play with. And you can create maps. Here's a map of prostate cancer death rates. Okay, I was telling you perhaps, you know, black people are optimized to live south. Well, unfortunately, they also have double the rates of sunshine related cancers or other diseases. And furthermore, there's actually a gradient. As, as people move northward in the world, there is greater uh, prostate cancer, just like I showed you a while ago. Um, when you hear about medicine in the news, and reporters have to think about it, and they don't usually present it to you. The problem with regard to science is you have to think like a lawyer. How good is this evidence? How good is it? And much of what I've shown you to this point is called cross-sectional, like questionnaire-based, epidemiologic evidence. It's circumstantial, like, were you in town when they robbed the bank? Yes or no? That's circumstantial evidence. It's not a direct picture of did you or didn't you. The better kind of evidence is we randomize people to two kinds of things. For example, I'll give you, in this half of the room, a thousand international units of vitamin D a day, and I'm not going to give it to you. And then we'll look at outcomes, cancer rates over 10 years, etc. And then you can actually say, well, yes, we did it, and we've got firsthand true evidence of something. Um, I'm going to sort of end with a little bit of things to make you think about. The problem is with vitamin D, nutrition, the research and the perfect evidence hasn't happened yet. In the year 2001, there was an, an interesting paper published um, by Elina Hirponen in Finland. And what they did, in, in Finland, they have very good health records. It's a public health system. And how do you know whether somebody has juvenile diabetes? Whether the health system computer record tells you they've got a prescription for insulin. So what they've done is they followed people born in 1996 